there is an unbelievable opportunity that exists in the marketplace today that customers don't know about that we've got the opportunity to educate them on. Um, all right, let's kick it off. So, Gary, obviously, you have a lot of time at Evolve IP. I think it's, what, 15 years now? Yeah. You've been in the channel, uh, in the technology space for a long time. So let's just kind of go through the trends that you've seen starting out, um, the different solutions that you know were popular, were trending, that sort of thing. And then let's go get to where we're at today and, and give us your thought around that. Thanks. That's the that's the setup question, folks. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I'm going to and I'll, I'll throw it out on the table because it doesn't matter. I'm going to be uh, 62 years old in October. As Zach mentioned, I've 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 spent the last 15 at the helm of uh, of Av IP's channel, and another 15 before that, just being in, in inserted in this community. Um, I was around as many of you were when UCAS went from a, a bleeding edge to a, to a cutting edge solution to where we're at today, which is a mainstream solution. And what popped up in the early 2000s was, you know, hundreds of companies that were selling UCAS. When the UCAS market began to show signs of commoditization, which is not a bad thing, by the way. It's now a mainstream solution. No one's, you know, no one's considering buying an Avaya PBX over a UCAS solution. A lot of us ran to the contact center space. We saw a lot of contact center companies pop up uh, around the same time. We've moved away from MPLS into SD WAN, and we got a lot of SD WAN companies popping up. But one of the things that I've noticed: every event that I go to features ten more security companies that all have a better mousetrap, and they're all talking about that cybersecurity is the next huge big opportunity that we should all be invested in. And um, I think what I'm finding amusing about that is, you know, we are still trying to secure a PC network that we deployed before the pandemic, right? We still have PCs connected to servers, and then everybody took them home and we're using VPNs to get to those servers. What I find ironical about the whole thing is that the first slide I see at every event is either here's the Wi-Fi code to log in or here's a QR code to scan to register for the next event. And what I find kind of a bit, you know, a bit ironical and also kind of humorous is that if that Wi-Fi has been um, compromised or that QR code has been compromised, on one hand, we're going to talk about the importance of cybersecurity. On the other hand, we've just invited everybody to get infected. So it is one of the things that, um, you know, that continues, you know, let's not run after the fad. Let's run after what's important, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna state it now in the beginning of the call, and hopefully we'll have some more conversations. If you are not engaged in IT, right? If you are not engaged in the IT of the company, you are on the outside. And if there's one goal I would have for everybody on the call is, if you are not engaged in the IT business, you need to figure out why and how to do that. That that a good start, Zach. Absolutely. All right. What else you got for me? What's a good What's a good place to go with this? Good place to go. Well, Jack. Well, we can certainly get into. I know um, we talked about you know the 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 trends you know the trends of the technologies that that were popular throughout the years. You know we talked about how um, when SD WAN came or came about, you know, there was a lot of SD WAN providers, you know, kind of take us, take us through that. And, 
what that what what that's looked like, you know, especially when we could we talk about how many security providers there are today, you know, where uh, where do you, where should partners put their, you know, where where do they place their bets? Right. Okay. So that's it's a great place to start, actually. So there's a slide that I use now in my presentations, and the slide says, "Is virtual desktop an alternative desktop solution?" or is it a security solution? So I'm hoping that you guys are all talking to yourself and you're saying it's both, because that in fact is the answer. Again, when you think about this, you've got every event we go to, there's 10 new security companies. They're all selling the same things, right? They're all selling endpoint protection. You know, The answer is let's do a vulnerability analysis. But there's a lot of analogies that I that I always like to use. Let's say you had that, you know, that old MG little two-seater sports car, right? You love that car. And you every year you take it to the mechanic, and every year there's a few more things that are wrong with it. Until one time you take it to the mechanic and they say, Hey, Zach, unfortunately it's gonna cost you 25 grand to get this car drivable. Zach, you know what you're going to do? What? You're going to get a new car. Now, I think there is an unbelievable opportunity that exists in the marketplace today that customers don't know about, that we've got the opportunity to educate them on. Okay? So virtual desktop, let's talk about that as a security solution. Right? Now, <laughs> As soon as I have a PC provisioned by IT that I take home, I've got a vulnerability, right? So what I find that's really interesting here is that most IT managers are continuing to deploy, manage, maintain. Think about that. I got to buy PCs. I got to provision PCs. I got to secure PCs, right? I got to patch them, update them, manage them. Right? I got to deploy them out in the field. I've got to secure them with the VPN. And ultimately, you're going to have to refresh them anyway. And now, of course, we're deploying PCs for people like remote contact center workers that have a turnover rate that is in excess of 40%. And what kind of threat is that? Give me back my $2,000 PC and I'll give you your last check for 60 bucks. So, Daz is a security solution. And just like the conversation around that old sports car you loved, sooner or later, you're going to replace that, right? Sooner or later, you're going to deploy a desktop solution, right, that's built and secured in the cloud where the endpoint doesn't matter, right? That's the answer to the long-term security solution. One other thing that I want to make a point about. You know, we talk a lot in this business about concepts. And even when we get into those top five reasons that people go to DAS, some of it's very conceptual. Now, when I think about concepts, right, CX is a concept. Zero trust is a concept. Security is a concept, right? There are tactics to achieve it. But it's a concept. And if you ever want to know how to define a concept, consider this. Call up CDW and order 50 zero trusts, 75 CXs, and 100 securities. They'll look at you like you got three heads. Right? So how you deal with security is you can keep running around patching holes in a PC network that was built for people to be in the office. Right? When we deploy PCs back in the day, it's because 90% of us went to the office. The only people that had to use the VPN were the nuts like me that traveled all the time. Right, So we're not changing our deployment method. And the reason we're not doing it is because clients don't know about it. Right, And that's where I think some of these opportunities really come into play. So before we get into the other use cases, let's talk about this idea of 
UCAS customers making great DAS prospects? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought that one up because uh, that's that's one of the things I've been I've been digging my heels in on now. We as a channel organization seems to have forgotten the fact that the way that we sold that the way that we sold UCAS back in the day was very simply I'm going to rep replace the capital expense with an operating expense. Essentially, don't spend a hundred thousand dollars for that Cisco call manager. Give me $3,500 a month. CFOs loved it because CFOs don't want to spend capital, right? Let's, let's also not forget that we are looking at probably the worst economic conditions that we've seen in the last 15 to 20 years. The DAS sale is exactly the same as the UCAS sale. We are replacing the need to acquire PCs and servers with an operating expense, virtual desktop, virtual servers, right? So that's the place to start, you know? And if you're sitting in the audience and you're thinking, well, I don't know, I don't know if I want to talk about DAS, I'm not an IT expert. Trust me, you weren't a UCAS expert when you were going around telling CFOs that they can replace that capital expense that they'll ultimately have to replace with another capital expense with an operating expense, right? And I think that's, we have to drive that. We have to drive DAS as the same thing as UCAS. We're replacing a CapEx with an operating expense. And we have to drive DAS because DAS, in fact, is a security solution. And it's a better security solution than managed detection and response. And it's funny, if you even talk to the security guys, I want to make I want to make note of this, you know, especially the guys that are selling SASE and they're selling endpoint protection and they're selling you know MDR and XDR and all and all the different DRs that are out there it is virtually impossible to deploy these solutions when you can't get all the PCs together right so it's actually and it's kind of funny we all seem to have this conversation i think these solutions are great endpoint protection everybody should have that but you only want to have it after you've migrated all of your desktops to the cloud. Otherwise, you'll spend the next year trying to do it. So that's where I'm going with that one. Um, so Daniel brings up a good point. Uh, he's talking about you still need an endpoint device to access the DAS seat, which is a great, a great point. And we talk about this all the time. How you know, just just talk about all the endpoints that that are you know usable with DAS, if you will. So you know what I think was really interesting? Um, yes, you got to have something, right? The, the neat thing about DAS doesn't make a difference what that something is, right? Um, it could be an iPad. It could be your phone. It could be a Chromebook. But what's really most important, Daniel, is that what are we trying to do? We're trying not to buy another PC, right? So the best part about DAS is it, significantly extends the life of your existing devices. One more thing that I find fascinating, all of us have had the same experience. You know, we're meeting with a client, they insist on taking us into the server room. And what's the first thing you see when you walk into the server room? There's a stack of laptops. What are they? Oh, they're the old Windows 7 machines that still light up. I don't have the heart to throw them out. I don't want to spend the money because they got all kinds of nasty chemicals in them. Anything will run DAS. That's the beauty of it. Because in virtual desktop, we're delivering CPU, RAM, disk, and the operating system from the virtual desktop. The device is merely showing an image of what's being computed in the cloud. So not only do I get to extend the life of my existing hardware, I probably get to put some hardware that's been sitting on the shelf back in service again. Because it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. Zach, back to you, bud. So um, one thing we've been talking about too, and just something that I've heard, when you, when you look at UCAS versus DAS, as far as you know, the life of the contract, t talk about what happens at the end of a UCAS contract versus the end of a DAS contract for the or for the end users. Well, 
I bet you're looking for an answer. I'm not sure I'm going to give you, but it's sort of this, you know, I think again, what's happened in the UCAS space is we forget about 2008 and 2009. There's been six or seven iterations now of, hey, you went to Evolve, now we're going to take you to Ring, and after Ring, we're going to take you to Eight, and after Eight, we're going to take you to Momentum. So what happens at the end of those terms is that we, we're we now migrating based on, can I help you get a lower cost and in the process maybe catch a nice spiff? You know, the one thing about that we all want, and I think we've all learned this lesson if you've been in this business for a while, right? Don't chase the short money, chase the long money. The long money is we want to put a solution in place with the customer that's going to be there forever, right? So when you sell somebody virtual desktop, no, no lie, it's not easy to migrate to the cloud, but it's virtually impossible to migrate off of the cloud. You know, I keep thinking about this all the time, Zach. You know, there are still 50 companies out there selling telephony. In our channel, there are two companies, us and RapidScale, that are channel friendly. Difference with the Bob IP is we still pay incentive money. I asked Kevin Sullivan recently, our, our head of solution engineering, is there a right time? And the right time is all the time. You know, we need to be engaging in conversations about virtual desktop as the new way to deploy <clears throat> as the new way to deploy IT in this post-pandemic economy, because it meets all the th issues that we have. We're trying to extend the life of our hardware. We're trying to turn CapEx into OpEx. We're trying to have a solution that helps us get closer to the proverbial, you know, security perspective that we're looking for, right? Um, we're replacing a capital expense. Most important of all is, it takes a whole le lot less time to manage a DAS environment than it does to manage a PC environment. And I'm asked this all the time, you know, and I, I want to get into some of these top five if I could, Zach. You good with that? Yeah, let's let's answer Daniel's second question really quick. Um, he's just asking about is if our DAS solution, if it's compatible with all different endpoint technologies and operating systems, and he mentioned Apple and Linux. Again, the operating system of the device isn't important. What's important, Daniel, is that we want to be able to leverage real-time audio video, right? There has been one problem that DAS used to suffer from. It's the that a virtual desktop won't run a YouTube video and you can't do a um, um, uh, you can't do a, a, a webinar from a virtual desktop. Well, that's been fixed and addressed by both VMware and Citrix that you can now deploy what's known as real-time audio video. And what real-time audio video is doing is it's leveraging the components of the end device. What is that end device that you typically want to leverage? A PC, because it's got a sound card and it's got a video driver. So that's what real-time audio video is doing. So we like to say virtually any device. I mean, listen, I could run a virtual desktop on my Samsung S23. Can, can I run it? Sure. Is it exactly the most easy thing to do? It's not exactly the best form factor to run, to run your desktop on. I think the biggest challenge that we have right now is with Chromebooks. Chromebooks don't play nicely. With the the Chrome OS has a problem in running real time audio video, but for the most part, we don't have a ton of people coming to us asking about thin clients and zero clients and iPads. What they're mostly interested in is taking that existing device that they've already paid for and being able to get more life out of that. That existing device is PC. PC's got video card, got sound card, and that's exactly exactly what we're leveraging to deploy real-time audio video. Is that, is that the answer, Daniel? Give me a nod. Outstanding. Yeah, let's, right, get into, Zach, let's get into some use cases. So we already talked about DAS as, as a security solution. I can't tell you that that is still the primary thing that we want to talk about is that, you know, moving your desktops, you know, or keeping data in the data center, right? Is, is a really critical component that makes DAS 
truly a security solution. All that being said, there's another couple of things that I want to talk about. I got news for you. DAS is cheaper than PC ownership. Cheaper, right? Not lower total cost of ownership. It is cheaper. Let's talk about that a second. When was the last time any of us went to Best Buy, bought a PC, took it out of the box, plugged it in? We can't do that. We're already conditioned to know that that PC, A, we got to put some antivirus on that. We got to put some web filtering on that, right? We're going to have to get Office 365 so we can actually do something with it. So every PC has to be provisioned. I bet you it wouldn't surprise any of you to tell you that on the average, a physical PC requires four hours to provision. An IT guy is $150,000. Four hours is about four to $600 per PC. So you not only do you have the cost of the device, and I'll tell you where the buyer gets tangled up. They'll say, okay, well, what's the desktop? The desktop is 50 bucks. What's the PC? 1200 Right? That means in two years I paid for the PC. Wrong. Because... On top of the cost of the device, you need four hours to provision it. You got to secure it. Last time I checked, Trend Micro and Norton and all that other stuff, that's not free, right? You got to put you got to put a productivity software on there. If somebody's going to take it home, you got to put a Cisco VPN on it. You got to put antivirus on it. You got to put web filtering on it. Got to have RMM because you might not see that device again for six months. Right, you got to manage that PC, you got to patch that PC. Ultimately, you're gonna have to replace that PC. So, I can tell you right out of the get go, I have no issue telling any potential buyer that DAS is a cheaper solution than PC ownership. We just have to get people past the top line, right? And once they fully understand and appreciate what goes into Procuring, provisioning, securing, managing, maintaining, refreshing, and now the new term is called reclaiming, right? How many of those $15 an hour call center agents are walking away with their $2,000 PC and leaving their $50 check on the table, right? So that's the second thing. <clears throat> the third thing is, if there's one thing I can say about the pandemic or COVID-19, and I think we would all agree, there will be a COVID-20, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Jazz is the ultimate DR and business continu continuity solution. Think about what, what happens. You take your PC, you went to the office, you come home, you plug it in, smoke starts coming out of it. You are dead, dead, you can't work. Remember, the one thing about Daz is I can get to it from any device. So I, if I'm staying in my hotel room in Houston, I just go down to the lobby and go up to the hotel PC and log into my desktop. So if you think about all the things that could potentially cause your PC network to go down, well, you've got acts of God, floods, and you've got lightning strikes and hurricanes and all the rest of that nonsense. You've got hardware failures. It happens, right? And then the last thing is you've got this next pandemic. So people now are making decisions based on money, CapEx versus OpEx. They're making decisions based on, I got less resources now than I used to have because it's a shitty economy, right? They're making decisions based on how do I provide a more secure environment for the company and for my employees? And finally, they're making a decision that says, I got to pass when when COVID hit, if if COVID-20 hits, I ain't getting a pass again. So I better be ready for this. We have to make sure that we're selling all that. All right, let me go back to my notes. And this goes back to what Daniel was talking about. Dazzle run on virtually any device. But what's more important, I think, than the fact that it'll run on every device is that it extends the life of what you're already using and what's Equally as important, I think we fail to stress this enough, is that it's not only will it extend the life of the existing PCs, it allow, it will allow devices that have been sitting on the shelf 
to be put back into production. Now, the last thing, if you haven't figured this one out yet, there are no call centers that are office-based anymore. You know, I saw my friend Jack on the phone here. Jack and I remember walking into call centers and you had to cut through that cloud of cigarette smoke. Well, that's because we're old, we remember that. Um, fast forward to the last 10 years, you just had to cut through all the Lay's potato chips. Fact is, nobody in a, as a call center agent works in an office anymore. So think about that. One day they came in and somebody said, go work from home. The first thing that comes out of the mouth of somebody making $15 an hour is, I need a PC. This is the uh, unbelievable opportunity. If you are handling call center customers, that is the last person they want to buy a $1,500 PC for. Okay, Zach, I well, said what I had to really, say. Really quick, while we're on the topic of contact centers, by the way, any contact center solution will run inside of Evolve IP's virtual desktop. Zach, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not. Um, a year ago, we went to 5.9 because we shared a couple of big clients and we said, you know what? We want you to certify our solution. And right away, they're like, well, what's your application? Here's our API. I'm like, I don't need your APIs. I'm telling you, your desktop runs in my virtual desk. You know, your contact center software runs in my virtual desktop. Bob IP's got desktop customers running 5.9, running Ring, running 8, running Zoom, running Nice. It's just an application to us. It's no different than installing QuickBooks. So we went through a process with them. And at first, they were like, no, no, no. <laughs> it, 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 it won't work because, you know, we need, we need the voice and we need the media to be running locally. And we proved them wrong. Not only do we prove them wrong, but the fact of the matter is once you take your voice and run it outside of your desktop, now you have a compliance issue on your hands. Mm -hmm. So thank you for reminding that I can run anybody's contact center software inside my PC because software is always the same. Remember any piece of software you buy, when you get to the requirements, tells you how much CPU, RAM, and disk you need. As right? long as we've got that in the virtual machine, I can run any software. Okay, Zach. All right. So at this point, I'm going to unmute everybody. I noticed a couple of questions come in, but I would like you guys to ask them just with, you know, in your own words. Um, so um, mics are now good to go. So let's start with, um, so Daniel had asked about some larger successes, um, some wins in the past couple of years. And it's interesting that that we talk about the uh, five nine case uh, regarding Service Mac because that is a great um, success story that we've had uh, involving another supplier's contact center solution. So, do you want to walk Daniel through um, kind of what we did with Service Mac? Yeah, I mean, what's great about Service Mac is Service Mac was mortgage business. We all know what happened to the mortgage business. Service Mac had requirements. Those requirements were <laughs> they had a thousand people. They didn't want to hire more than three IT people. They're still running with three IT people. There's no way that a thousand employee company running a PC network could have three people. It just wouldn't work. Right. So their second requirement was is they wanted to leverage lower cost devices. Right. And this particular case, they happened to be deploying some Chromebooks, some iPads, some zero clients, some thin clients, but they're spending a couple hundred bucks for every device. Um, the third requirement was they had already selected 5.9. So we needed to prove out to them that it would work. And because their financial business, they needed compliance. And now because all their voice goes through the desktop, they maintain PC compliance throughout the entire organization. 
Now, that's the win for the client. The win for the partner is, think about this. It's a thousand desktops and a thousand contact center seats. The account is billing for us about 120 grand a month and about the same amount of money for five nine. We've never had to go down this route, but obviously they have they've, they've also it's the gift that keeps giving, right? They have come back and they have bought antivirus, they bought web filtering, they migrated all their Office 365 to us. It would be a bear to unhook this. Right. One of the things I love about virtual desktop is, and you guys remember the days of selling circuits, some knucklehead comes along with a 5% reduction in the cost of that circuit. There's nothing that holds that client from changing besides your relationship. Ain't that easy with virtual desktop. It is not, it is not easy to migrate from one desktop provider to another desktop provider. Right. But that does remind me of one thing, Zach. Keep 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 one thing in mind here. If you're not talking to your client, if you're not talking to your client about desktop, somebody else is definitely going to be in there doing it. So you, you gotta do it. You have to do it. Um, Daniel, go ahead and uh what you got, man. Yeah, I think you're still muted if you wanna unmute. There he is. Okay. So what is the process if you're <clears throat> taking a look at all the data that's going to sit on the DAS endpoints? So you mentioned Outlook, you mentioned, you know, I, in my questions here, I've got like specific industry software, such as VIN Solutions for the automotive industry or Metasoft for the medical industry. But think about all the data that's currently sitting in the servers you're talking about, you know, you're doing your VLANs and your VPNs and stuff like that to that data. What is the process and the cost to upload that data from the server into the Evolve IP cloud so that all your DAS endpoints can access it? Because yeah, that's, so, that's going to be an application question the customers are going to ask. Yeah, of course. And what will end up happening is the process is, you know, that you and the client will engage with our engineering team so we can provide the right size desktop. Right. I mean, if we're, if we're going to load up, you know, we're going to load up applications that require 16 gigs of RAM. We we don't want to we don't want to set them up with an eight gig desktop. Right. We have a problem there. Um, typically, there are two ways of seeding it. Right. You can either seed it, um, you know, on a direct connection into our environment, or you can put all your data on on a hard drive and send that to us and then we'll load it for you. So there are two ways of doing that. But the most important thing is, um, and then there was a third part you, you mentioned, Daniel, which is how do we know the software is going to run, right? Now, what I, I would be lying if I told you that every piece of software that's ever been invented will run flawlessly in a virtual desktop. That would be a lie. I would say the vast majority of software has been converted to running in an HTML5 protocol, right? And if we're unclear, we will load the software and do a, um, a proof of concept with the, with the client to ensure that it meets their criteria. We we don't we don't want we don't want to sign people up for a solution that doesn't work. So we want to engineer it. We're going to want to you know, believe it or not, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have experience with automobile and and I know we've got tons of experience in medical. So a lot of these software packages we've seen before. Um, and if we haven't seen it, it's not a it's not a major deal to load it and test it, which is we're gonna want to do that anyway. We're gonna want the customer to sign off that it's working the way they expect it to work. Is that what, about, what about yeah, what about demo accounts for agents? So, you know, we we talked about we, we've talked about that. It's it's not something that we would object to. The problem is, is that a demo for Daz just isn't all that exciting, right? And here's what I mean by that. If you hit the start button on your PC right now, that that's what Daz looks like when you launch it. it just looks like a new start screen. Um, 
where it becomes valuable as a demo is when it's got all your stuff on it. Well, I, I, I will say, I will say candidly, it depends on who's presenting it. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, um, I, I, but what I'm saying is if you're, okay, so if I've got an account set up, for example, and I want to do like, I'm going to be getting in front of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to do educational thing in front of businesses at the Chamber of Commerce. And if I can go, like you said, grab one of those, you know, used PCs out of the IT room and I can sit there and I can log in and show that I can have access from a used PC, I can, I can get the concept to the audience, hey, this is something, and, and then we can talk about the security access of it and the, and the, the financial benefits. That's why I'm saying a demo account. I, I, think, I think it's something that's worth exploring. I can tell you that in the past, one of the challenges have been is that if I launch, if I load you a demo account and don't embed your work environment in it, it's like you can launch Chrome and go browse the web. Um, I I have found I have found it to be a bit underwhelming. It's when it where it's, where it's really when it's overwhelming is when all of a sudden you know I'm logging in from an iPad and looking at my desktop that I recognize. But not out of the question. I, I think we should definitely continue to talk about that and talk about how do you make that demo compelling. See, once we start migrating your data, well, there's a lot, a lot of money in that, involved in that. So we've got to be careful about that because I, I can't, we can't spend our time building demo accounts for people, especially if it requires, you know, hard, hard um, engineering effort there. So something to talk about. Cool. Um, Jessica Riley, what do you have for us? I put it in the chat, but I'll, I'll, I, I figured if I raised my hand, maybe I get a shot of getting an answer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how do you get customers to trust you with data when they know you for voice? You know, I'm their trusted voice person, have been for a long time. And I see more and more something that Gary mentioned earlier. I see where, you know, they, they'll go, oh, sorry, I'm not going to go with what you're bringing to the table. My IT guy suggested something else. And then I ask them what it is, and nine times out of 10, I just want to go, oh my God, that's going to be terrible. But that said, if I'm trying to get, I'm trying to go the opposite direction and I'm trying to get into their data, you know, they they have an they have an IT company, they have an IT person, you know, they've trusted them. Why are they going to go outside of that and trust me with their data? And how do I how do I I broach that is the question. You know, I think I think it's um I think it's a reasonable question. And I think that um you know, when you look at it, like, so they have an MSP and the MSP they're paying. He, you know, they run around fixing their PCs. Um, are, but are they really, are, are they really moving that business forward? The, the very first thing I think, though, that, that, that helps in this is virtual desktop does not replace people, right? There, there's, there's, there's this fear out there that if I begin to engage in this conversation about IT, that I'm I'm somehow threatening your job. Um, uh, so I think for sure, you know, you've got to be able to deflate that. You've got to be able to de deflate that. And you know, I mean, I guess the big, the bigger, the bigger thing that I that I'm thinking in my mind is, hey, I've never brought this up to you. But has anybody talked to you about virtual desktop? What happens when the answer is no? You got to be kidding me, right? Now all of a sudden, maybe you found an angle to wedge yourself in, right? Because nobody's really talking about it. The the MSP is getting paid fifty dollars per you know per employee per month. They're not trying to to stretch the status quo. Who else besides their CIO or CTO? Right. The other the other thing too about this is the thing I love about virtual desktop is you are not limited to talking to IT. You can take this message to their CFO and say, "Listen, I got something that you need to look at from both the security and cost perspective." So maybe right there, Gary, is the answer is the fact that maybe your best bet is you know staying away from IT and going to the money man and saying, "Hey, you know, I've got a better way." 
and maybe I think that's I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true because IT's funny, you know. They want to stick their head in the sand until all of a sudden, you know, they're shit out of luck because there's been a breach, you know, and you know. I and think they all think they know everything about everything. You know, you can't tell them anything. <laughs> yeah. the, but the last thing you want to be is listen. I'm not. You know, you don't want. They want. They want to cram you into that. You're the voice person. And I'm telling you, you don't want to be there. I'm not the voice person. I've been guiding a lot of the technology that you guys have been using for years. But I understand. I get it. So it's a, it's a good question. And it's something that we want to continue to work on. But the more that you do to educate yourself will will make you more confident to have these conversations. And it's all about confidence. And you, when you say educate yourself, what can I do with the resources you have that will help me go down that path? Well, first things first is, um, well, I'll, I'll take a step back. The, the, the guy with the beard that's running this thing, Zach, he can he can one he can uh he can give you some he can give you some materials that that you can we can brand to you mm-hmm. that you can start to get out as if it's coming from you yes um but if you go through the engagement process with somebody that says hey give me a few minutes let's talk about whether there's an application here or not I think you know there's there's something else that we're working on in the background, and I, I I shouldn't be talking about this, but I'm going to we're working on doing this bundle, right? And we're look you know we're looking to price it so that it's so compelling that people have to look at it. Now, when I talk about bundle, let's talk about like big rocks, right? It's your PC, it is your server. Your server is your Active Directory and your domain controller. It's your storage, right? It's your security. It's your productivity suite, right? Which is Office 365. It's your backup, and it's your and it's your PBX, right? Now, do we think a lot of people will be in a position to buy it? No, because somebody's got a contract with somebody. But if it's but it will get people thinking. It'll get people thinking in the direction that we want them to think, which is you need to view all of your technology as one big capital expense that you can now shift to. See, one of the things other people love about DAS is we find this to be the case all the time that they don't care if it's $70 or it's $170. It is a fixed cost per employee. It never goes up and it never goes down. Financial people love that. We'll keep talking about it, Jessica. We hope we'll find a way for you. Yep. All right. What else, Zach? Um, let's go back to Jeremy Duffy. He was asking about. Well, wait a second. Okay, we'll hit Jeremy and then we'll go to Scott Russell. Um, he's asking about a car dealership and their accounting software connecting to an existing and separate VPN. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> the car dealerships that we service, they all have either Reynolds um, or um, some other type of accounting software that runs the entire dealership that goes back to a, to a data center that's, that's supported by the, the accounting software company. How would we inter- how will we integrate with that? Well, the first thing we have to determine is one, is that a web service? Right. When I so remember, remember, remember the like and a and a web service is like Salesforce. So the only thing you really need to enable Salesforce is browser. Right. So I think with a lot of the automobile companies. They're online because they want you, they want this data to get back to their servers. Mm-hmm. So if it's a web service, we're going to be able to support that. If it is what we refer to as a thick client, best way for me to describe a thick client is, Jeremy, you have your own business, so you know this. There's QuickBooks and there's QuickBooks online. There's QuickBooks that you install on your PC. That there are people that live and die by that. That's a thick client. 
<clears throat> QuickBooks Online is a web service. If it's a thick client, we have to engineer the solution. Is it out of the question? 100% no, it is not out of the question. But it needs somebody smarter than me talking to the customer. Got it. First, so there's first people smart. Wait, wait, wait. So Gary, there's people smarter than you. I knew that was coming. <laughs> you know, know what you're telling me? If I don't get my stones busted by Jeremy Duffy, <laughs> it has not been a good day. <laughs> well, I wish you'd stand up. Oh, uh, here we go again. <laughs> All right. Turn this man's camera Thank you, off, Gary. Zach. Uh, that's funny. Um, let's go back to I think it was Scott Russell. Scott, you want to hop on and tell us what you're thinking? Well, okay. If he's not around, his question was, um, customer using DAS today, what is the advantage of changing DAS vendor to evolve? So maybe if, yeah. So if, they, if, they're, if they're using DAS today, what would be the advantage of changing over to evolve IP's DAS? Typically what we are seeing is we are seeing people that have moved to an Azure virtual desktop or Amazon workspaces, right? So they go with the big carriers. And the problem with the big carriers is they, they don't support real-time audio video because they're running a protocol like RDP, which doesn't support that. So typically what we see from people that are migrating from one DAS provider to another is of course, there's the financial reason, right? Um, legacy DAS providers have typically been very expensive, but but the I think the main reason is because there are capabilities out there that they're not able to leverage. And it is especially the case um, against people like um, AWS and Microsoft because those protocols don't support real-time audio video. Oh, I think I missed a question from Bob Reno. Um, Bob, you still around? You want to ask that one again? Yeah, sure. Uh, customers that tell me, hey, you know, I just bought, you know, 100 new PCs. I buy them every two to three years. I don't I don't need that. Um, that kind of conversation. They've already bought and they're used to buying a certain way. And so basically, they're not listening to what I have to say. They just keep they're in their world, you know. I mean, listen. I think this is this is what Jessica was talking about too. You've got some of these IT guys that think they know everything. Um, I think what's interesting though is that, hey, I bought two hundred PCs, and in three years, I'm going to buy two hundred more PCs. One, you still got a security problem. Two, you now you know. I think one of the things that's so funny about this, and when we launched Teams, is a, you know, we used to one of the things that we competed against with people buying Teams was, I can do this myself. Yes, you can. And three o'clock in the morning, when the CEO's in Hong Kong, and it doesn't work, who are they going to? Who's the CEO going to call at three in the morning? Ain't gonna be me. It's sort of like the definition of insanity. I can do what, you know, I can continue to do what I continue to do. I mean, if anything, Bob, what I would probably say is, would it hurt you just to learn about an alternative way to the, to the, to deploy desktops? You might see something that you like, and you might not. No harm, no foul. Um, I think I think that there are people that are set in their ways and they're set on their ways. Again, when I think about this, if it was the old days and my and 95 people out of my 100 people showed up in the office every day, I'd probably still want to continue to do things the way I've always done it. Fact of the matter is, I can go into my office in King of Prussia right now. There's probably eight people in there. You could shoot golf balls at Evolve IP's headquarters and not hit a single person. Um, so I think I think that the dynamic has changed. Maybe the, the strategy hasn't, but certainly the dynamic has changed. Are your people coming in the office every day? Wow, how'd you get that done? I'm hearing from my other clients that say, 
80% of the people are still working from home. You're not concerned that that's a potential risk that 80% of your employees are logging on to your network from an unsecured broadband connection? Okay. I mean, well, don't you don't you find it more difficult to support your 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 customers' IT requirements when they're not there? You know, I like to think about things from the perspective of the old days. You know, guy with the ponytail came down, hand you your PC. If you ever have a problem, I sit on the second floor, come up and see me. <clears throat> you don't work there anymore, and he don't work there anymore. Now what? You know, it's very, very difficult to support your customers in a in a mobile work environment. So these are all really good points that you've made, that Jessica's made. It's ain't easy. Um, but the rewards are, listen, it wasn't easy way back in the day either when we were trying to sell unified communications to people that only knew buying PBXs. Ultimately, I believe that the entire world will migrate to virtual desktop because it's the only thing that makes sense in a mobile workforce environment. Ultimately, they will run all their vulnerability analysis and plug all those endpoints as long as they want, but sooner or later, they're going to get breached. You know, and I hate selling fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So sooner or later, it, just like Zach's MG midget, you know, when it got too expensive to keep it on the road, he got a new car. And I think that's going to happen. So we just have to keep plugging away at it, fellas and ladies. Well, just to add to Bob's um, thought, you know, yes, this organization just bought 100 PCs, what have you. But then what does that mean for their IT staff? What that means is they're going to be so busy managing, patching, doing all these things for these physical devices that now you're taking them out of the, you know, strategic initiatives that ultimately you want them working on. And now they're just, you know, pushing buttons and pulling levers all day. And, and furthermore, you know, Mr. CTO, CEO, is that what you want your IT staff to be doing? Is that a good use of their time? That's why Kevin Sullivan calls Daz an IT staff multiplier, right? It's not a replacement. It's complementary to your IT, your IT staff. So yes, you can go out and buy all these PCs, but now you're spending, your IT staff is spending all this time, you know, again, pushing buttons and pulling levers, which isn't ultimately what you want them doing. Good, good. That's probably, that's probably a wrap, is it not, Mr. Zach? Well, possibly. I was going to give everybody, a, you know, one more chance to speak up. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Otherwise, I, I always like to say, just like Gary alluded to earlier, um, I am your marketing guy, okay? So anything that you need, um, from us, whether it be co-branded collateral, I also have, um, you know, drip sequences that you can use for your customer base. Um, so you just, put, you know, we can put your your logo on it. Um, we can, I can give it to you. You can send it out to your your customer base, what have you. you that's that's all there for you. If you want to get creative and do something different, I'm your guy. But um, I always like to make it a point just to say that whatever you need from a marketing perspective, I'm your guy, and just please let me know. My man, thank you guys. Great chatting with everybody. See you in the field. All righty. Thanks, everybody.